Let's give a round of applause to Will Iscott. interactive session, so you do want to keep your Google Park forums on hand? Yeah, we'll use those again. Play Canvas. Uh, so I'm going to talk about VR today, through the hot topic. And um, but more specifically, I'm going to be talking about how the web is playing a role in the development of VR. So uh, I'm a recovering 90s applica uh, VR application developer. Okay? I started out my career in the mid-90s uh, working for a VR company up in Manchester. Um, and um, so yeah, some of you may be surprised to know that VR has actually been around for quite some time. And um, uh, you know, if you go way back, um, you'll find that uh, even Jessica Fletcher was using it to solve murders uh, back in 1993. Right? Although I do suspect that those are sunglasses. But anyway, um, so uh, you know, I, I think really what's what we've uh, what we've had is this sort of slow burn uh, of, of VR over the last 20 years. And, um, uh, and while, while that was kind of going on in the background, I switched to the games industry. I worked for Activision, Sony, uh, and uh, Electronic Arts. Uh, but fast forward 20 years, and I'm working on this stuff again. And it's you know, largely to do with this guy, Palmer Lucky. So back in 2011, he was building the first Rift prototype uh, in his garage the following year, uh, runs a successful uh, Kickstarter campaign to raise two and a half million dollars. And then, of course, uh, things start to really kick off uh, when uh, Facebook swoops in and purchases Oculus for two billion dollars. Uh, and, you know, one of the side effects of that was that uh, the VC community set up and took notice, and suddenly there's huge amounts of VC money sort of sloshing around. And if you head out to Silicon Valley now, <coughs> Um, every other tech startup is working with VR today. Um, okay, so uh, why are all of these companies investing so heavily in VR, uh, and you know, why is all this piece of money there? It's because the prediction is that uh, VR is essentially going to be the next computing platform. Of course, today we're using laptops and mobile devices, touch interfaces. Um, but the thinking is we'll be consuming a great deal of our content five years from now. Uh, in VR and, and AR. And there are some insane predictions being made about the size of this market. I mean, I read on the web the other day that um, even somebody was predicting $150 billion by 2020, which I really don't think is going to happen. But it, it does, I mean, that's, that's like significantly bigger than the entire video game industry. Okay? So, um, but there are still some big numbers being banded around. So a lot of money is being put into this, and it can't afford to fail. Again, if you count. The is the first time um, so uh, you know we have to ensure its success. How do we do that? Well, let's just you know ask what the consumer wants, right? Uh, as a VR consumer, um, as somebody who likes VR content, um, you know what do I want from that? Uh, this is my list. It's not necessarily your list, but um, you know I'm looking for content that has very low friction to access that content. I don't want to download and install. Uh, all of my VR content, maybe some of it, but not all of it, certainly. Um, I want to just be able to like, click a button and start streaming awesome VR content. Uh, not much in the same way as you would say a YouTube video, right? Um, and I want it to be cross-platform. I want it to work absolutely everywhere. No matter where I am, on whatever device, I want to be able to access my VR content. I don't want to have to be stuck in the lounge, you know, on my PS4, 5, whatever it's going to be. 
I want to be able to uh, have freedom to access this content from anywhere. Uh, and I want it to be shareable, the good stuff I want to share with all of you guys. And I want to do that in the channels where I spend my time. So on mobile today, I spend over 40% of my time in social networking applications and instant messaging applications. And that's why I want to share VR content with you. I don't want to send you uh, the name of some app you have to go find in that sort of. So, uh, and of course, because that's where you share content, that's also where you discover it. Uh, and lastly, uh, you know, I want to be able to access the content that I want to see. Right? I don't want some arbiter of decency to tell me what I can and can't watch in terms of VR. If there's something controversial, if there's something um, R-rated or whatever, I should be able to choose what I want to watch. So, you know, all of these things kind of add up to the web rather than an app store. Um, but there's a big problem here, which is that if you're a developer of VR content, uh, it's fairly likely you know, you'll want to monetize it. Let's say you're making a hardcore game, um, then you know, you're going to want to be able to monetize that time. Um, and on the web today, it's pretty hard to monetize payments. Uh, that's just the, the sad fact uh, of reality. Um, but the W3C is working on this today. If you go to that link, you can read about all the fantastic, exciting stuff they're doing with payments. Uh, to make uh, storing of uh, payments information easier uh, in web channels. Um, I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm just going to uh, use my get out, get out gel pre card and just say not all the VR con content uh, needs to be monetized like apps do. Right? So, uh, I mean, let's look at a couple of examples. Uh, the first one being uh, something that Nickelodeon released uh, last week um, to promote the new Turtles movie. Um, which I'm sure you're going to go to. Um, and this is a little kind of, I mean, on the desktop, it's just kind of like a kind of move around and get these kind of little AR markers to read about uh, this particular scene in the, uh, in the movie. Um, but on the, on the phone, it uses the accelerometers and you can look around. Um, uh, and this kind of content doesn't work as a map, right? It's a bit of promotional content. In the same way that this app um, used to promote another well-known game franchise uh, called GT Black Ops 3, um, this is a similar kind of story. So um, if you play Call of Duty, you can configure weapons in Gunsmith, and this is a similar kind of thing. So it's kind of translated to the web, uh, I can select components on the gun, and uh, just kind of build my weapon of choice, share it with my friends. Etc. So this is the kind of content I'm talking about when I when I say you know, it works works really well in the in the web context. Um, but we haven't just got to please the consumers, right? We've got to keep the developers happy and give them the tools that they want. Um, and again, you know, I'm a developer, right? And uh, I look for certain things. I mean, this is obviously a short list, but there are certain key things that I look for when when I'm developing. Uh, probably a key one is having. And this we kind of touched on in, in the last talk is you want to just be able to target one uh, un, uh, sort of unified platform when you're dealing with VR, um, because there's there's such a variety of devices out there, anything from cardboard all the way up to uh, to a bike, um, and then you have all of the different uh, controller types as well, and it gets very complex. So you want to be able to abstract that away and just be able to write your content once and have it run absolutely everywhere. Um, now. I'm part of the open source community. Uh, I'm a big believer in open source. Um, I don't want to work in a closed system. I don't want to deal with, uh, I want to avoid proprietary technology where I possibly can. Um, so that's another key uh, uh, factor for me. Uh, I want to be able to iterate quickly. I don't want to have to compile and link and you know, wait uh, five minutes while I'm sort of rebuilding uh, my application. I want to be able to make quick changes and develop fast. Um, and lastly, I want to be able to publish constant, uh, content in an instant. I just want to be able to hit a button, make my content live, and put it in front of my audience. Um, so really, I, what I'm talking about here is modern web development. This is, this is what it's like to be a web developer, right? Um, you don't have to deal with um, you know, weeks and weeks of uh, submission times and things like that. You make some content, you put it live on the web, and it's in front of an audience, a potential audience of billions. Um, so, you know, uh, Hopefully I've convinced you that there's, there's, there's some merit to publishing VR content to the web. Um, so if you're going to make uh, VR content 
on the web, and you're going to want to say target card. What are you going to need? What are, the, what are the two things you're going to need? Well, first of all, you need hardware accelerated 3D graphics. And after that, you're going to need head tracking. Uh, and the nice thing is, mobile browsers have been able to do this for two years now. Right? Um, so in terms of 3D graphics, uh, the browser has an API called WebGL. Uh, WebGL is uh, essentially a JavaScript interface to the GPU in your device. And um, it's essentially layering OpenGL ES. Um, and on the head tracking side of things, uh, mobile browsers have an API called device motion. And in these devices, you have accelerometers and gyroscopes, and uh, essentially it's just an interface to that. So you have exactly what you need to start making basic colorful VR experiences today. Uh, things get a bit trickier if you want to start doing high-end VR in the browser. If you want to start ta targeting a Rift or a Vive, say, um, you're going to need a few more things. You're going to need low latency head tracking. Um, and uh, that will include uh, positional tracking as well. Um, you need uh, to also match the refresh rate of the device that you're rendering to. So um, Vive and Rift, they both, they both uh, render at 90 hertz. Um, but actually, the, the browser can only render at 60 hertz. Right? So we need some kind of a mechanism to match the, the refresh uh, rate of the device that we're with, with piping the content to. Um, and lastly, we need some kind of an interface for, uh, for, for the new traps controllers that we're, we're seeing being introduced now. Um, so, uh, to deal with all of this, the browser vendors have got together and they come up with something called WebVR. So, WebVR is a, uh, well, it's an in development standard, uh, open standard for. Um, interfacing with any uh, uh, VR device. Um, so, so far the history of both VR has been that back in April 2014, um, the likes of uh, a couple of guys from Mozilla and Google got together, and they uh, started to work on this, this API. Uh, and then they spent the last couple of years doing that, and then in March, the API hit 1.0. Um, and just a few days ago, the W3C announced that this is going to be a uh, standard. So uh, they've started the process to make this into a standard that uh, can then be formalized and then rolled out into every single browser. So this is getting pretty serious now. Um, so the rollout of this technology uh, is going pretty well so far. You can already get special builds of Chrome and Firefox that has WebVR built into it. Um, not forgetting uh, Samsung Internet for VR. That, that's, uh, that browser supports it too. Um, but things get really exciting <laughs> come October because that's when Chrome for Android 54 comes out and that has WebVR 1.0 built right into it. So in October, tens of millions of Android devices are going to support uh, WebVR. Uh, Firefox will uh, follow with an implementation being released very shortly afterwards. We're still waiting for word from Microsoft and Opera and Apple to see what they're going to do, but um, I'm Pretty bullish that they're going to be um, they're going to be following the lead of uh, uh, both Google and Mozilla here. Uh, so yeah, you know, you're ready to start uh, making some VR content for the web. What are you going to do? Uh, well, first of all, you better go and learn WebGL, WebVR, and all of the other APIs that are going to be needed to make the content. Um, you'll probably be spending quite a lot of time doing that. But is there an alternative? Uh, indeed, there is. Uh, it's something that I'm working on. It's called Play Canvas. Uh, this is a, uh, a WebGL game engine um, that uh, has um, WebVR support built right into it. So back in 2011, uh, I left Activision and I started working on this technology. Uh, and really the, the thinking behind it was that we were trying to create a technology that was going to fill that gap that Flash was going to leave, because we knew Flash was going away. A lot of people were in denial at the time, but like, it was definitely going to happen. So uh, that's why we set about building this. Um, today, uh, the community is just approaching 100,000 people, um, and these developers are making VR experiences, video games, gambling applications, visualizations, all kinds of stuff. Um, and you can see that on playcanvas.com. Um, but the cornerstone of, of Playcanvas is, is our editor application. Right? So uh, the editor, um, if you if you've worked with a visual editor before uh, from another game engine, then this will look kind of familiar. 
you know, you've got a 3D view, you've got hierarchy, asset panel, inspector. But the key difference is that this is running in a web browser. Um, and because it's running in a browser, we've been able to do some things that um, you probably haven't seen before in a game engine. So one key thing is that we built Google Docs style real-time collaboration into the platform. So uh, you can have a team that's distributed uh, geographically, and they can collaborate in real time to, to make a game. Now, if you struggled with uh, some other game engines and getting, getting that to work efficiently with the team, then this would be a real revelation to you if you start using real-time collaboration. Um, and all of this technology is built on top of uh, a JavaScript runtime. So this is built for the web. It's not written in C++ and then compiled over to run JavaScript. It's built for the web. And it's mobile first. Uh, and the engine itself is only 140 kilobytes. So that means that it will run on very low end devices all the way down to an iPhone 4X. Um, and if you want to find out how we built this thing, you're in luck. Because it's open source under MIT. You can head to GitHub um, and grab the whole code base and, and see some of the cool stuff we're doing with this engine. Um, so yeah, I mean, like, uh, I think we're very proud that we managed to squeeze this down into such a tiny, um, tiny bite-sized library. Um, so what kind of things have you been making with Playtime as well? Uh, this is probably our best known uh, game. Uh, this is called Tanks. It's an online multiplayer tank battle game. And um, this game probably at the moment gets about 50, 60,000 play sessions a day. So it's not exactly ADAR.io or Slither.io or something like that. But it's, it's popular. And um, this is the kind of game that you publish to the, to the web and uh, you can certainly monetize. Um, but we're really proud back in... Uh, back in March to release a new <coughs> mode into this game where we added uh, web VR support. So uh, Tanks ended up becoming the first online multiplayer web VR game. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we announced this, we kind of launched it, that's the Zilla scale of GDC, uh, so it's featured by them. And um, one of the key things that we had to solve when we, when we added the VR mode was we had to remove all of the 2D HTML interface in the game, and we had to replace that with uh, a 3D interface that's kind of embedded in the 3D world. Um, but anyway, it plays like a tabletop game, you're kind of sitting, sitting next to the table and you're kind of controlling, controlling the text in there. Um, okay, anyway, that's enough slides for now. So what I want to do now is just um, uh, switch out of uh, the browser. It's probably also worth pointing out that my whole presentation is just a web page. So I can embed any of any playground's content and just play it back like a YouTube video. So I, this is why I love that one. Um, okay, so let's let's head to playground just quickly, uh, and I'll sh I'll give you a flavour of how you might uh, create, publish, and share this kind of VR content. Okay, so just give some really basics without a huge amount of time. Um, okay, so this is the homepage on Playcanvas. This has a bunch of devlogs that uh, developers on the site are publishing. Um, so if I go to my um, project page, so this is like my GitHub, GitHub profile page but on Play Canvas. Um, if I just hit new, uh, there's three options that you can select. There's a, there's a blank project, a model view starter kit, which is just a viewing for your models. Well, there's a VR start, starter kit. So if I select that, and I call this up with Buzz, um, and that project, it takes me to the um, project dashboard, and um, I can do a bunch of stuff here. I can add team members and all that kind of stuff. But I'm just going to dive straight into the editor, and you'll notice how quickly that, that application loaded. Right, the editor is about 600 kilobytes, uh, so it's super lightweight, and you, you can even run that editor on your mobile phone, um, which is pretty cool. Um, all right, so this is a really basic scene. There's a bunch of uh, geometric shapes in here. Um, so if I wanted to play back this scene and see what it does, uh, I simply have to hit the play button, top right. Um, and on my laptop, I don't have uh, a, a rift or anything attached to it. So if I just tap, it kind of falls back to just sort of you know, mouse controls or touch controls or whatever. Um, but if I want to, I can do this on my phone. Um, so I can just close this. Uh, but to be on my phone, so what I would normally do, if I was back in the office, I would just take that URL and just put it in Slack, and I would just open my phone, and I'd go get that URL, and I'd see it. Um, but what I'm going to do is instead, is I'm going to publish this and make it live. 
Uh, I'm doing that because if you guys want to do this, um, you otherwise you have to log in. I don't I want to avoid having to do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to publish this little app. Uh, success version one. Publish it. Um, click on the link. So that link is live now. So that just by clicking that button, that web app is live on the web, and you can access it from anywhere. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the URL to kind of make it easy for you. Uh, I'm going to just edit it slightly. And I'm just going to put that in Bitly. Okay, right, so if you put, if you put that into your phone, and um, you've got your VR, cold VR headset out, um, you can just load up that, um, that app, right? So I'm going to do that myself. So, see, so yeah, open the on Safari, the slash, okay, so number one, uh, small t, eight, small j, W. W. Okay, so that, that app is now live. If I put my iPhone into uh, landscape and just tap on the screen, uh, it starts stereo rendering. And I can just grab my antiquated little cardboard VR headset, slide it in. Ah, the metaverse. <laughs> right. Okay. So, so that that works fine. Okay. So, you know, let's say I want to I want to iterate on that now. Uh, what can I do? Well, uh, I don't know. If I want to add a bit more content to the scene, uh, I could say add an animated character. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hide these shapes. Save all, and I'm going to upload uh, a 3D model, uh, an animated character. So I'm going to create a folder in my asset view. Uh, call that man. And I'm going to just go to my local file system, just drag that FBX file into my canvas. It converts it straight away. I can drag the character into the scene. Now that's a Lego man, right? They're about that big. So I'm going to have to make him a bit bigger. So you can see him. Let's make him kind of human size. Okay. Um, right, so there's my, uh, my Lego man. Um, and I want to animate him. So uh, I'm going to have to assign an animation to this character. So I'm going to an animation component, sign an animation. Um, and uh, last of all, I want to uh, duplicate this guy. So what I'll do is I'll just kind of place him uh, two meters over there. Just duplicate him. <coughs> duplicate him. Okay, so um, I guess the only other tweak I've made actually is that it kind of doesn't look very plasticky. So uh, if I just kind of select all the materials and you just change the specular on the materials, so maybe we can turn that a bit, make it quite glossy. Okay, and I'm just going to kind of rotate these Lego guys so they kind of facing the facing the, the VR camera so that when we're kind of standing in the middle they're kind of dancing around us. <laughs> uh, okay. okay, so there we go. So they're kind of all facing us in a, in, a, in, a, in a circle. Great, so let's just test that quickly by launching it in the, in the preview. So there we go, we've got Gangnam Style Dancing Lego Man. Uh, surrounded by them. It's terrifying. 
Uh, okay, so <laughs> right. Um, just exit to uh, right. Cool. So let's um, exit that. So that works. Great. So I can republish my app. So let's do publish version two. Publish version two. Publish. Okay. And we're going to set version two as the current current app to build. There we go. And all we have to do now is go back to the browser. Now, unfortunately, you can't refresh it because um, the building link I sent you is a, is a redirect. So what you need to do is you need to just kind of, from your history, just put in the building link again, which uh, I think it, it, it ends in WEC, right? And now we've got <coughs> dancing Lego around us. Okay, so if I place that into my and so again, cool. We're being entertained by Lego. Great. Um, so anyway, that's that's a really quick, simple demo. But it, I hope it shows you how super quickly uh, you can you can uh, create and publish and share this kind of content on the web. And I think this, to me, is what uh, the future of VR is all about. Um, so that's all I wanted to talk about. Um, Thank you very much uh, for listening to my presentation today. I hope you enjoyed it. Um